run by the U.S. or any other country. We gather at 5 o'clock the following day at the federal uh, courthouse downtown and protest. And I imagine we'll probably do the same thing if the U.S. attacked anywhere. Um, so keep that in mind. And uh, Adrian was going to be speaking on the domestic costs of military yeah. spending. so much, you know, I'm really honored to be as part of this panel. Can you all hear me? I've been popping Sudafed and aspirin, but this cold is getting the best of me. My voice is at about 50%, but I'll try to project. Um, so I don't need to tell any of you all that the biggest threat to our country um, is not any foreign entity. It's most definitely not Iran, it's not Syria, it's not even Al-Qaeda or similar groups, despite everything that we're told. Um, the biggest threat to our future is us, it's ourselves. Um, the biggest threat to our society's future and to our children's future is really our own um, incredibly misplaced priorities. We as a country are pouring almost a trillion dollars a year into war, defense, and what we call national security, while barely investing at all in the things that actually build a future in our children, in infrastructure, in the environment, in green technology, in, in uh, transportation. It's almost like we're destroying our country in order to allegedly protect it. It's almost like suicide, or maybe it's more like murder. I'm not sure which. Um, but basically, um, this is what our federal budget looks like. And you don't need to read the fine type here. I know it's a big group. Um, but this right now is what our federal discretionary budget looks like. And the big red zone, the 60%, is our spending on war and defense. So you can see that 60% of our federal discretionary budget. By comparison, just 6% of federal discretionary spending uh, goes to education. 3% goes to HUD, housing. 1% goes to the environment, and 1% goes to transportation. And I don't want to get too wonky here, but this is actually an underestimate of the true cost of war and defense. So this red zone actually does not include some things, like it doesn't include the interest on the debt, all the bor borrowing that we did to pay for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan, because those wars were entirely funded by borrowing, and our children and our children's children and their children will be paying down that debt, paying for those wars um, for generations and generations. Um, it also, as you can see, it actually, this chart actually lists things like NASA and uh, the Department of Homeland Security separately from defense, and so that sort of undercounts the cost of defense too, because those specific budgets actually are very much related to defense. For example, defense contractors all the time use NASA technology for rocket propulsion and spy satellites, um, et cetera. So again, this red zone is actually an underestimate of the true cost of national security. Um, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist David K. Johnston, who's an expert on economic and tax issues, argues that if you count up all the different hidden, hidden expenses, the true cost of national security by its broadest measure was expected to be more than $1 trillion last year. And by that measure, national security basically gobbled up almost all of the federal income taxes that we all paid to the IRS last year. Now, to be clear, this chart does not include Social Security and Medicare. Those programs are mandatory programs, and they're treated separately in terms of the budget process. They're paid for by payroll taxes, the FICA tax that comes out of your paycheck. Um, according to formulas that are preset. But this chart is basically the federal budget. It's the budget that Congress and the President Obama battled over um, and that we lobby for and all those conversations uh, between the President and the Senate and House are about sort of this and sort of shifting, like how much do we shift the lines in terms of this, this chart. This is the budget. Our state and our city pays dearly, both pay dearly, um, for war spending. Um, we sacrificed so much um, for this. Um, and here are just a few examples of the sorts of trade-offs that we make to support the war machine locally. One, for the amount that the state of Virginia contributed to the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001, we could have instead completely paid for more than one million four-year college scholarships. Two, alternatively, for our state, yeah, for our state's portion of the wars, um, of the cost of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we could alternatively have, have had more than 100,000 additional elementary school teachers in the state teaching our children over the past five years. Um, 
And I recommend the website, the National Priorities Project. And if you go to that website, they have this cost of war trade-offs tool where you can sort of plug in and come up with all of the different trade-offs for different categories of defense spending based either on the state or on, on the city of Richmond. Um, more locally, the entire Richmond Public School budget is equivalent to the cost of just two F-35 fighter jets. And for the cost of just one F-35 fighter jet, you could actually build an entire regional rapid transit system in our metro area, or you could pay to send every single Richmond High School graduate to college. And I know that these particular ideas are actual ideas that are being proposed by the city's anti-poverty initiative. Um, and funding these sorts of things should be a total no-brainer, but we instead um, are sort of met with this um, artificial austerity. In the 10 years after 9-11, military spending almost doubled, reaching heights unseen since World War II. And even with the sequestration, which you probably remember imposed a small like budget cap, a small reduction in spending across all categories of the federal budget, including the military. So even though military spending was brought down just a hair, um, even given that, um, we are still spending more on war and defense today than the next 13 countries combined. Um, the idea of military spending, it can feel sort of abstract and far away, and at RPEC, we really want the public to understand the very real and direct cost to our community of, um, of war spending. And on tax day, in a few months, on April 15th, we are planning to once again be at the post office on Brook Road in downtown Richmond. I invite everyone to come. Um, we'll be handing out information to thousands and thousands of Richmond taxpayers who will be coming to the post office that day to pay their taxes. Um, and we'll be explaining to them exactly where their tax dollars really go. Most people who pay taxes imagine that their federal income taxes go to pay for things like potholes and schools. Um, but as we've been talking about, that's just not true. But it's so important for all of us to understand that another way is possible. Um, and when I look at this chart, I just think like, what abundance there is, what abundance there could be for the people if we stood together and if we actually got our priority straight. Um, at RPEC, um, we're continuing to educate about and advocate for reductions in military spending and a shift to investing in human needs. Um, and we invite everyone's partnership in that. And we are also launching a new advocacy effort to put economic conversion on the political agenda in Virginia. So we will be calling all year for our elected leaders to proactively work to transition those industries and regions um, and workers that are dependent on military spending into other forms of green and peaceful economic activity. We want Virginia to be building solar panels, not naval destroyers. And this idea of economic conversion, of transforming the economic base of Virginia is really important because Virginia is the state, the single state that's most dependent on military spending, both in absolute terms and in relative terms compared to any other state in the nation. Um, by one measure, something like 13% of the state's economy is actually dependent on the military. Because the Pentagon is here and the Norfolk Naval Base is here and Virginia is basically a mecca for military contractors. Um, and so this state is, in some sense, at the heart of the military-industrial complex nationwide and what happens here really matters. Our state has so organized its economy around war and made jobs dependent on war, um, and it's so often the case that when we start to have this conversation with the broader non-activist community, we are met with this question of, what weight don't we need to continue military spending in order to protect jobs? So in people's minds here, jobs and war making are very much linked, and we need to break that link. Um, and that is what's motivating our effort on economic conversion. And I know the state of Connecticut has begun to lead on this issue. So Connecticut just this past year passed a defense conversion bill where they formed a commission to um, work to transition industries in Connecticut dependent on defense money into other forms of economic activity. And this is not sufficient, it's not utopia. I mean, there are industry representatives on that commission, but there are also labor and peace groups on that commission as well. Um, and at least it's a start, and it's much more than we're seeing happen to date in Virginia, where basically no, no one in the political leadership is questioning um, the permanent war economy that we really have here in the state. So um, we understand that it's an uphill battle in Virginia, and the defense interests here are so entrenched. Um, and sometimes you feel like a tiny little minnow swimming upstream against you know, the military industrial complex and 200 years of American empire, but um, I believe that together with all of you, um, we can and should and must continue um, our struggle 
in the knowledge that we really do face a fork in the road as a society, we can continue to go the path of an overextended empire that is spending its treasure on war, or we can choose to reprioritize our natural, national resources, shifting funds away from war making and toward building a more peaceful, green, and just economy that supports working people. And it really is a choice, and there is so much at stake in the outcome. Thank you.